So hi guys, today we'll talk uh, today's lecture number six, which is subepidermal vesiculobullous disorders in the series for residents that we are doing for dermatopathology. So when we talk about subepidermal vesiculobullous diseases, the first thing that should always come to your mind is yes, there is a subepidermal split. So is there any inflammation in the dermis? Or is it posse inflammatory? So subepidermal split, posse inflammatory, that is very little inflammation in the dermis or subepidermal split with inflammation. So if there's a lot of inflammation, then the next question that you should ask yourself is what is the kind of inflammation that I see in the dermis? Is it a lot of eosinophils? Is it a ton of neutrophils? Or is it predominantly lymphocytes with no eosinophils and neutrophils? So based on this thinking process, your list of differential diagnoses will narrow down quite a bit. So when we look at the first category, which is the subepidermal split, which is posse inflammatory with very little inflammation, your list of differential diagnoses narrows down to either it is PCT, which is porphyria cutinis tarda, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, or cell poor bullous femphigoid. So once you've decided, then your list is very short now. So let's start with the first case where you have this 54 year old female that presented with blisters on her dorsal hands and forearms. So you can see the blisters on the dorsal hand and the forearms. There are some associated milia and there's a lot of scarring. So when we look at the biopsy, very classic subepidermal split with very little inflammation in the dermis. So now I know I'm dealing with either PCT, I'm dealing with epidermal Lysis bullosa acquisita, EBA, or cell poor bullous femphigoid. So what are the other features that can help me now narrow down the diagnosis? So this classic feature that you see here is called festooning. So what does festooning mean? Festooning is when the dermal papillae, they retain their outline. So they are, they are not collapsed. Normally they should have collapsed, but because the dermis is very sclerotic, they do not collapse and they retain their outline. So this, this dermal papillae retaining their outline is known as festooning. The other feature that we see here is this basement membrane material that is still stuck to the roof of the blister. So this basement membrane material that you see stuck to the roof of the blister, these are known as caterpillar bodies. So caterpillar bodies, festooning. And then the other feature that you can see here is this, when you go high power and you look at the vessels in the dermis, you'll see this thickening of the vessel wall. This is reduplication of the basement membrane that is seen in PCT. And this can be highlighted with PAS. So if you do a PAS, then you'll see a, a dark pink uh, area around the blood vessel. So based on this feature, your diagnosis becomes very easy. This is porphyria cutinous stardom. Now pseudo porphyria is going to show you exactly the same histology. So histologically, you cannot differentiate between pseudo porphyria or PCT that is more drug related and uh, so pseudoporphyria is more drug related and <clears throat> PCT is part of a group of genetic disorders in the heme biosynthesis pathway. It can be hereditary when it is associated with a uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase mutation or it can be acquired and we saw the clinical presentation of blisters and erosions which heal with milia and scarring. The patient also has photosensitivity. And in the hereditary form, the other thing to remember is the patient can sometimes present with hypertrichiosis of the cheek. So we already talked about the other differential diagnosis that you should think of in the posse inflammatory subepidermal split is EBA and cell poor bullous femphigoid. So EBA is an acquired skin disorder where in the anti where you see circulating antibodies to type 7 collagen in the blood which is IgG antibodies and the classic EBA presence with subepidermal split with very <coughs> little inflammation in the dermis. So here we see a nice example of EBA. So let's make this orient this slide right. So the epidermis is on the top. Now we see again subepidermal split, cell poor infiltrate in the dermis. So we know we are dealing with either of these three conditions and not too much of festooning, thickening of the basement membrane around the vessel wall, 
no sclerosis. So all these features then help you make the diagnosis that this is either of the three, di three diseases and then the clinical pathological correlation is what will help in differentiating between the two. So if this was a cell poor BP, then you would see also a linear IgG and C3 at the dermal epidermal junction on immunofluorescence. So here's an example of a cell poor BP. There is some inflammation <coughs> predominantly composed of lymphocytes and then if you look carefully there are some eosinophils here so here's one eosinophil and then the immunofluorescence pattern the age of the patient will help you make the diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid so even in a cell poor subepidermal split you shouldn't rule out bullous pemphigoid it should always be in your differential diagnosis but classically bullous pemphigoid will present with a subepidermal split with a ton of eosinophils in the dermis so here is a nice case, clinical example, 72-year-old male presents with pruritic bullous eruption for the last 10 days. And then the biopsy is very classic where you see the subepidermal split, a lot of inflammation in the dermis. And when you go high power, you can see it's associated with a lot of eosinophils. So 95 point or even 99% of the times older age patient, if you see this pattern, it is going to be bullous pemphigoid. So these patients present with significant pruritus, generalized tense bullae, often on an erythematous articular base. Another thing to remember is BP can sometimes present without the bulla, so it could be the articular phase of BP. So whenever you see an older patient that has a lot of eosinophils in the dermis, even if the bulla is not there, you should at least consider for once, besides drug eruption, that this could be an articular phase of BP without the bulla. So once you think of it and then you call the clinician up you, the, and, you, and you, you advise immunofluorescence and then you can make the diagnosis even without the bulla. And the immunofluorescence is going to show the linear IgG and C3 at the dermal epidermal junction. And the target antigens you need to remember is the bullous femphigoid 230 and the BP 180. And here's a nice example of the linear IgG and C3 at the dermal epidermal junction on immunofluorescence. The other diagnosis that should be in the differential whenever you see a subepidermal split with a lot of eosinophils is bullous drug eruption, bullous arthropod bite reaction, and herpes gestationis. So herpes gestationis is pregnant female, younger age patient, but exactly the same histology. So subepidermal sub split with a ton of eosinophils. So if you see that, it's very important to make sure that you find out the history because if this is a younger patient, it's a female pregnant, then your diagnosis is not BP, but herpes gestationis. Herpes gestationis immunofluorescence is a very bright C3 in 100% of the cases at the dermal epidermal junction. The IgG may be weak or absent, but a very bright C3 at the dermal epidermal junction is very characteristic of herpes gestationis. Bullous arthropod and bullous drug can show the similar picture. So here is an example of a bullous arthropod bite where you see a subepidermal split, a lot of dermal edema, and then in the dermis there is a lot of inflammation that you see going quite deep actually. So here you can see perivascular interstitial inflammation that is composed of lymphocytes and a ton of eosinophils. So there's almost like an eosinophilic party going on here basically. So, and like one thing that we have always, that, that I have observed is that if you see the eosinophils going into the subcutis, that is more in favor of a arthropod bite reaction. It may be true, may not be true, but that is an observation. So subepidermal split with Significant inflammation in the dermis with eosinophils or gets deep. So the 99% of the times bullous amphigoid, pregnant female herpes gestationis. Uh, the other diagnosis to consider would be bullous drug and bullous arthropod bite reaction. Moving on to the next category when you have a subepidermal split with a lot of neutrophils in the dermis. So now your list of differential diagnosis is again going to narrow down. Either it is linear IgA vesicular bullous disorder, either it is bullous lupus, either it is dermatitis herpetiformis, and if it is an older patient with mucosal involvement, then you have to think of secretial pemphigoid. So very narrow list of differential diagnoses. 
So here is an example of a 15 year old female presents with pruritic vesicles of the elbows, knees and lower back. And when you look at the histology, it shows the very classic dermal papillitis. So let's make this straight. So you go, you look at the dermal papillae and they have these neutrophilic abscesses that you see here. So you see a collection of neutrophils in the dermal papillae. It's not throughout the epidermis. It's not a continuously through the dermal epidermal junction, but in focally in some of the dermal papillae. And this is a very classic pattern for dermatitis herpetiformis. So these patients can present at any age. They are associated with significant pruritus and they often present with pruritic papules and vesicles often grouped and more common on the extensive surfaces. <coughs> For the board exam, you need to remember that the target antigen is anti-tissue transglutaminase. And then if you do the immunofluorescence, you're going to see the granular IgA within the dermal papilla. Here's a nice example of the immunofluorescence pattern that is associated with dermatitis herpetiformis, where you see this granular IgA deposition in the dermal papilla. The other differential diagnosis that we talked about are linear IgA vesiculobullous disorder bullous lupus and cicatricial pemphigoid. So here is a nice example of a linear IgA vesicular bullous disorder where the patient classically present with this tense polycyclical blisters and if you do the immunofluorescence you are going to see the linear IgA. So if you look at the histology here we can see again there is a subepidermal split. So here is the subepidermal split again. So the epidermis is sloughed off at the dermal epidermal junction and then this is lifted off. And when you go high power, it is composed of predominantly a lot of neutrophils here. So if you see this neutrophils lining the dermal epidermal junction, you have to think of either it is linear IgA vesicular bullous disorder, which could be related to some drugs like vancomycin and or bullous lupus basically. And the only way to differentiate would be doing an immunofluorescence. The immunofluorescence is going to show you very nice linear IgA if this is a linear IgA vesiculobullous disorder and if it is lupus it is going to show you a full house. The other feature that you might sometimes see in lupus is the association of the inflammation also going around the hair follicle. So you can see this inflammation is going around the eocrine structures. You have the split, you have the eosinophils but then it is also going around the air follicle. So the histology, the immunofluorescence pattern, the, clinic, the clinical picture, serology will then help you make the diagnosis of bullous lupus. Cicatricial pemphigoid is usually older patients, mucosal involvement. So this is, this is a biopsy from the mucosa. So you don't see the granular layer. So you know you're dealing with a mucosal biopsy. There's a subepidermal split. There's a lot of inflammation here composed of lymphocytes, neutrophils, even some eosinophils and then the clinical pathological correlation can help you make the diagnosis of cicatricial pemphigoid. And then the last category is the subepidermal split with mostly lymphocytes and then you have to think of bullous LP. So here's a nice example of lichen planus. We talked about in I think lecture number three where you see the hypergranulosis, wedge-shaped hypergranulosis. So if you start from the top, uh, hyperkeratosis, no parakeratosis, wedge-shaped hypergranulosis that you see here, the linear, the lichenoid infiltrate at the dermal epidermal junction associated with dyskeratosis, and then you see the split here, the max Joseph space. So because of the split here, this is bullous lichen planus, otherwise this is very classic lichen planus. I think that was the last slide in this uh, in this uh, on the, in this uh, lecture. And for any of these diagnoses, if you need additional in-depth information, you want to see more clinical images, you want to see more digital slides, you just go to publications.pathpresenter.net. This is a free resource available, dermatopathology for residents, and has in-depth information about a ton of diagnosis that you that is freely available to you on any of your devices. Thank you and. See you next time.